We thought the future of AI, we thought it would be just like the menial, low-grade, low-paid tasks would be automated by technology that behaves intelligently using very basic skills associated with the human intelligence, its ability to sense what's going on, learn from its environment and its experience. But actually, no, it's that bit of humanity that we thought was special and unique to humans, which is our ability to be curious and to be creative and to create new things and what this technology has just shown is that actually machines are brilliant they're winning ai designers are winning fashion contests ai photographers are generating photographs that are actually synthetic photographs and not of anything but they are photorealistic they're winning photo competitions fine art competitions are being won by ai over humans it turns out that ai is really good at being creative Welcome to Freedom Matters, where we explore the intersection of technology, productivity and digital well-being. I'm your host, Georgie Powell, and each episode we'll be talking to experts in productivity and digital wellness. We'll be sharing their experiences on how to take back control of technology. We hope you leave feeling inspired, so let's get to it. This week, I'm speaking with Dr. Paul Marsden, a consultant psychologist specialising in the effects of technology on how we think, feel and behave. Paul works with businesses to help them understand how tech transforms people's expectations, their relationships and experiences. In 2022, he appeared in the award-winning movie I Am Gen Z, a documentary film on teens, tech and well-being, and has recently completed a study for WPP agency Syzygy on how people feel and respond to new AI technology like ChatGPT. In this episode, we discuss the arc of happiness, why the scaremongering around screen time might be misleading, and how generative AI is a powerful tool for better understanding the human psyche. Paul, welcome to the Freedom Matters podcast. It's great to have you here. Georgie, really looking forward to chatting with you today. To kick off, can you explain to me your role as a psychologist and particularly your role as a positive psychologist? Yeah, I'm a consumer psychologist and so I've been working oh, since the 20th century, I'm that old, with brands, helping them understand what consumers want. And it always struck me as somebody coming from a psychological background is that marketers have a really kind of negative, Debbie Downer, downbeat view on the world. They're always looking at people's problems, their pain points, what's wrong. And there's a whole area in psychology that just focuses on what's right about humans, what's right about the world, what makes life life worth living and it's positive psychology which is the science of feeling good and functioning well basically and so what I do what I've been doing for the couple of decades is actually just applying insights from this science of effectively happiness for brands helping them understand how they can promote and have a positive effect on human well-being and it's a different niche because whilst everybody's focusing on okay what's my customer problem what's my pain point is that you actually look look at pleasure points rather than looking at a people's problems you look at their goals and their aspirations and their hopes and it's just a nicer way to live a career when you're focusing on the positive side of things and you see the beauty in the world rather than see the disarray and destruction but you did quite early on start to notice that the way that we're using technology had its downfalls had its negativities that didn't necessarily give us those kind of happiness cues that you thought we should be getting from the way that we use technology, I think. And that's why you were starting to talk more and more about what I believe you were calling the arc of happiness or what is referred to as the arc of happiness in self-determination theory. Yeah, psychologists love models and there are lots of models out there around what drives human beings, what are our basic needs, psychological needs, emotional needs. But one foundational model that has been validated pretty much around the globe that is basically the cornerstone or foundation of positive psychology. It's a thing called self-determination theory, and it's got two major benefits. Firstly, it is evidence-based. It's been tested. But more importantly for marketers, it's really simple and simple to apply. And that it simply says that amongst the myriad of personal needs and desires and goals people have, there are three foundational things that drive our happiness and well-being. And that's just having a sense of personal autonomy 
that we are autonomous individuals and we can behave authentically and that we have a sense of freedom and control over our lives. And actually, when if you've ever been in a kind of relationship where you're feeling controlled, whether it be another person or a bit of technology controlling you and being controlled, it actually un- undermines your well-being. So in that sense of autonomy, it's absolutely key. Secondly, in this very simple but powerful model of human well-being is having a sense of relatedness. We're all born alone and we all pretty much die alone and we spend the intermediary period desperately trying not to be alone. We are social animals. We are more intelligent. We're more happy when we're with other people. And there's this study, a US study, the longest study of human well-being, what drives human well-being, that dates back 80 years. And their key finding is actually having positive rewarding, deep personal relationships, not lots of them, but a few really positive relationships. That is, it not only drives mental health, but also your physical health. Having this sense of relatedness is key. And then finally, the C in this arc of happiness, as I call it, as a mnemonic, A, R, and C, is having a sense of competence. None of us like to feel dumb, and all of us like to feel, okay, we made a smart decision. We are cognitive creatures, and we literally, cerebrally and neurally get off on actually being right and feeling smart. And so we have a sense of competence that we know we've been shopping, we found that little black dress, or we found that amazing deal, and uh, that actually drives well-being, or being competent competent in a relationship. Clinically, depression, in, in especially related to relationships, it means your relationship with your work or with somebody else is probably, you're, you're not feeling competent in it. You're not behaving competently. You're investing all this time in a job. You're investing all this time in another person and you're not getting any positive return on it. So you feel incompetent. And clinically, what happens in depression is that your body just shuts down and saying, look, stop it. Ball and stop it, Georgie. You're investing in the wrong person, the wrong job, the wrong activity because you're not being smart about it. So it really is mm. part of our human psyche. This this idea of being competent, and so these three things drive our well being. Once you've got that lens, you can apply it. Now to circle back to your question about technology, technology has a fantastic opportunity to increase people's autonomy. It empowers us. We can get what we like, what we wanted. It's like having another arm, but it can also shut down our autonomy. Think about autonomous vehicles. Think about the algorithms on social media that control your attention, control your time, and to a degree control your responses. Think about relatedness. If you're like most people in the research that I've recently done, the first thing you touch in the morning is not another human being. It's a bit of silicon. It's your mobile phone. And the last thing you touch at night is not going to be another human being. It's going to be a bit of silicon. And what does technology do when we have more screen time rather than actual human time, face-to-face time? And so technology can bring people together and social media can do that, but it can also pull people apart and make people more isolated. And, And social isolation is one of the biggest predictions of depression and deliberate self-harm and all manner of psychological problems. And then thirdly, competence. If you think about technology, it allows you to do amazing things. I'm a really rubbish artist, but I'm loving these new AI tools, the mid-journey, because I can use words and I can play with words. I'm not too bad at that. And you can turn what you can imagine, your words, you can turn your imagination into fabulous things. So you can actually turn somebody with zero artistic capability or competence into somebody who's actually relatively good. I'll never be a fabulous artist, but actually makes you feel more competent. But at the same time, Mm. all these artists are being replaced. So I think it's a twin thing. So where I stand on the well-being debate and digital well-being debate in particular is the midpoint saying that we can use technology to improve and bolster our arc of happiness, to improve improve autonomy, relatedness, and competence. That is this positive technology vision. But technology can also undermine our arc of happiness, undermine our sense of autonomy, relatedness, and competence. And it's up to us to choose how we do it. Sorry, very long answer, but it's something that really excites me. No, it's fabulous. And what I've been thinking about recently is the double layers of interaction, because what jogged me on this was John Mack's presentation about a species between worlds. And I went to see him do a lecture recently where he referenced your article where you look at how Pokemon Go was so attractive because it basically hit all the elements of the arc of happiness. It gave people a sense of autonomy. They felt related. They felt competent. And it was one of the things that made it so compelling and so addictive. And a lot of the products that we use individually might satisfy us from an arc of happiness perspective. But the challenge is that collectively they don't. 
Uh, I guess what I'm trying to work out in my head is these two layers between how single products might be able to satisfy us. But collectively, it then means that our, our days or the way that we spend our time or how we think, how exists society isn't necessarily as we intended and our relatedness and our competency is lost. I, I think you're right. And I think it's smart to look at, at different levels at an individual level. And I think it's probably from a, at least from a psychological sense, it's just about satisfying us. It's about enabling us. It's about you thinking of technology as an enabler. So, you know, so it's like a musical instrument. A musical instrument will take a musical ability and just make it better, make it real. And good technology extends and supports happiness and well-being. And it might do it at an individual level, but there are some uh, at a population level or aggregate level, some of the unintended consequences of technology, or maybe perhaps in some cases intended consequences, such as through the attention economy, through algorithms based on their ability to create grievances, to catastrophize, to sensationalize, and then have a kind of a negative loop effect. And you feel less competent because you just wake up and you look up after an hour of TikTok and you think, I've just lost an hour of my life. And so you feel actually not smart about living your life. Life. Recently, Paul has helped publish some research with Syzygy, which explores consumer perceptions to creative applications of generative AI. I asked Paul to talk a little about what he was finding fascinating about this new wave of tech. We know that there is something big going on, a big hype cycle around AI and particularly this generative AI. It's AI that generates new things. Your granddaddy's AI, which is just technology that behaves intelligently using skills associated with human intelligence, so like sensing, learning, reasoning, etc. Generative AI, this new revolution in AI, is technology that doesn't simply behave intelligently, but it's technology that behaves creatively using skills associated with human creativity. So it can create genuinely new and surprising output that's either useful, beautiful, or thought-provoking, which is kind of the definition of what creativity is. It's basically just like sophisticated autocomplete. You know, when you're typing into a search thing, it basically they will finish your phrase when you're searching for something. Generative AI does that. It looks for what it expects either the next pixel to be in generating art or what the next word is when you're generator, generating a sentence or a lyric or a poem. And it makes its prediction based on large language models of things people have spoken about. And people diss it as being, this is just a sophisticated autocomplete. It's not smart. But actually, if you're a psychologist, the first thing you think is, well, that's what humans are. We're sophisticated autocompletes. It's like we will respond <laughs> to a particular situation or a stimulus or a person, mostly habitually, mostly based on what do I expect to say next. And so what this technology actually does gives us, probably gives us a, as much as an insight into how the human mind works and how human creativity works as it does to machine creativity. And it stands to transform the world. I went to the robot hotel in Japan, absolutely amazing place. You go in, you get checked in by a robot you get a little robot caddy take you to a room your room's got a kind of an alexa device thing and cute japanese thing will talk to you only in japanese so it makes it really difficult if you're not native japanese speaking <laughs> the only thing that was actually human was the poor human cleaner who was wiping the windows and you think well is this the future where ai does all the kind of creative cool stuff and we just do the manual stuff and we see it's like mm. still in fashion where i do stuff it's like one of the really difficult things is to fold a t-shirt Machines are really bad at it, but actually humans are really good at it. And that dexterity of making moves in, in robotics, but it's tough, but it's transforming what we thought would be the future of AI, which we thought it would be just like the menial, low grade, low paid tasks would be automated by technology that behaves intelligently using very basic skills associated with the human intelligence, the ability to sense what's going on, learn from its environment and its experience. But actually, no, it's that bit of human humanity that we thought was special and unique to humans, which is our ability to be curious and to be creative and to create mm -hmm. new things. And what this technology has just shown is that actually machines are brilliant. They're winning. AI designers are winning fashion contests. AI photographers are generating photographs that are actually synthetic photographs and not of anything, but they are photorealistic. They're winning photo competitions. Fine art competitions are being won by AI over humans. It turns out that AI is really good at being creative. 
So the study that we've just done with WP Digital, Syzygy, which is part of WP Digital, is actually looking at people's perceptions of machine creativity. What do they kind of think of this machines behaving creatively? Because that's the bit that was supposed to be left for us, the cool bit. And actually, it turns out the machines are really quite good at it. What do people think? And the big finding is that that actually, at least in Germany, this is a national sur- survey of over, over a thousand uh, owners, a representative survey. People are actually positive about it. Most people think that this will actually make humans more creative and that will actually extend their own creativity. So you've got 24% of people who would actually like to use generative AI to create a digital clone of themselves. So when they're dead, they can continue to interact with people. And there's actually a real AI service. It's called Hereafter.ai. And you've got technology called deep nostalgia that actually can animate a photo of a lost loved one and turn it into a video. And the new technology will allow you soon to be able to upload their voice. You've got a snippet of their voice and they can talk to you. And one in four people are actually want to use this really creative use of this technology. But the big finding of the study is, yep, green light to brands, to companies. If you as a human can imagine it, we're getting to the point where AI can create it. If you can imagine it, AI can create it. What a fabulous world to live in. It is. It's really nice to talk to someone who's positive about it because it is also quite scary. So a lot of the conversations we have are around the challenges at the moment with the internet are that we're basically overwhelmed. We're overwhelmed with information. We're overwhelmed with content. The content that rises to the top is the content that's most likely to grab our attention. It is often more extreme or it's exactly what we're looking for, which can be a good thing. It's not always a bad thing. Um, Obviously, with these tools the volume of content that's available is exploding. We're already seeing it. And so I'm quite yeah. interested in how the content landscape becomes curated in, in a world where it's not an ocean anymore, it's a universe of content. Is that something that you've thought much about? Yeah, 100%. And we see it all the time. It is just fundamentally changing the way that we create, we communicate with people because you've just got this explosion of content that is going to be generated by AI that is going to be smart. My best friend now is GPT-4 um, and they use their open AI and you can do some really clever prompts. So for example, you can create a prompt which lists all the human fallibilities in terms of cognitive biases, decision things. And you'd simply say, you are a behavioral scientist and you have encyclopedic knowledge of all the different cognitive biases. Come up with a way to manipulate or present or communicate a particular product that will have the most effect. And it is just brilliant. Mm-hmm building on the world's encyclopedic knowledge in a way that no human expert can do. And so not only is it the sheer volume of stuff, you know, SEO is going to just change because in the next few years, most of the content that is actually available will be machine generated rather than human generated. And so how do you sift, sift through all that? But it's actually really good and it's compelling. That's for me, that's the worrying thing. It's just, it's better at communicating, better at capturing our attention, better at pursuing persuading us to act in a particular way than maybe humans are. Now, so I think the real challenges, especially for disinformation, we've got the US elections coming up, etc. And I just think we'll see a whole new wave of really, really smart disinformation. And so what do we do about that? And I think the answer is that you can diss the idea of solving technology problems with technology. But I think the way that Apple are looking at at this technology, trying to keep it personalized AI technology on a device. And if you think, I love the phrase, I can't remember who said it, but it's wonderful. And so I'm going to steal with pride saying, rather than think of this technology as ecosystems, AI technology is creating a new technology ecosystem. The future is actually about building ecosystems. And your ecosystem is your personalized AI assistant that will help you filter through and help you make smarter decisions based on your best interests. So rather than as kind of an Alexa or Siri that is parameter, the parameters are made for 
humanity, actually based on what's best for you in your particular situation, your personality and your history. And so if we can start thinking our own personal AI assistant, I think that's the way that we're going to be able to filter out not only mm. the volume that you talk about, that is just going to complete just the amount of information that we're going to, that's going to be created in the next few, few years. It's just unimaginable that it's going to be smart information to actually have your own personal assistant that actually acts as a secretary who filters out the stuff and say, oh, this is actually really interesting. Thinking of an AI as a kind of a noise filter, I think is probably a smart way and a personal assistant, a real tutor, counsellor, therapist that everybody has on board, personal and private on their smartphone, I think is going to be the way forward so we can actually profit from this amazing, amazing revolution. I'm just thinking everybody, think of all the people who don't have access to great medical, to a doctor, medical care. If you've got a smartphone, you're going to have a really smart doctor on there. Same with mental health, have your therapist. Same with education, tutor, actually adapting to the way that you learn and your own cognitive abilities. It's just going to be fabulous. It was at this point in the conversation that I was really sorry we didn't have another five hours because things were starting to get interesting. But I had to circle back and challenge Paul. I can see how a personal AI would be really useful, but what happens to our autonomy? Is this not just a case of the autonomous vehicle on steroids? It, I think then you get into real existential problems like what is freedom? Do we have free will? I'm not sure how you met your partner, but mine, it was just complete happenstance. It was very uncreative at work and it used to happen. Now it's done via apps. And so to what degree really are we in control of what happens? Because yes, we have our own decisions that we make, but the happenstance of the circumstances and the context, we're not in control ourselves. But what we can do is make informed decisions decisions. And we can make decisions that are authentic, autonomous, if our onboard AI therapist, counsellor, tutor, confidant, such as Snap is getting with, with the new Snap feature, you've got my AI on that. If it actually acts in your best interest and is importantly explicit, if it shows how it generated its particular recommendation or mm -hmm. the filter, then you can have the ability to take control and say, no, I want more of this. I want less, less of that. I think it's giving people control and you can only give people control when they can make informed decisions, opening up the black box, not black boxing technologies. So if your friendly therapist, Lexi, on board says, OK, um, Georgie, I think maybe consider this. If it then says the reason why I'm saying this is because stuff that you've done in the past or the reasons you've decision, then you can come, you can take it as an advisor. It's the difference between an advisor and a controller. And I think the advisor role is when it, it, it actually shows it's working. It doesn't simply come up with a solution. It says, this is how I got to this recommendation. And you can then make an informed decision and you can actually with that it's smart competence, autonomous, because you're in control. And then the relatedness can also co come in because it's about often our decisions about how we relate to other people. And just and if you're on board, Lexi therapy can actually say, look, this happened last time. You know, th what we Think about what happened. So think of it in terms of cognitive behavior therapy, learning smart, positive cognitive tricks in order to navigate the world in a more fulfilling and happy way. I think what you've just said is going to prompt so much thought amongst different listeners in different ways. And I'm really I really can't wait to share it. I think for me, I'm just thinking we've got a really big job to do really quickly to make sure people realise that these tools are tools and advisors for them to control. And that's like the tipping point, right? It's recognising and making sure that people are being proactive in the way that they choose to interact with these technologies and therefore using them in a really positive and beneficial way, rather than accepting that this is the default of how I now get fed content, how I now get fed information, advice, it's just going to come at me. I mean, that's why you're a brilliant podcaster, Georgie, because you just summarised in 30 seconds what I've been babbling on with Psycho Battle for a while. No, no, not at all. Yes, 100% yes. I feel like there's a lot of work to do, but this hopefully will get the work started. We can be positive about it. We can see the disarray and dysfunction in the world, but there's such an amazing upside, positive side to how technology can improve people's lives, help people feel good, function well, find meaning, find connection, find autonomy, find self-esteem through having a sense of competence in the world. It's going to be based on the decisions that we decide to take. We're, we're in control of the 
future. We can decide how to use this technology and we can choose to see the beauty in the world and increase the beauty in the world. And as positive psychology, that's what I want to do. Absolutely amazing. Paul, you've been a knockout guest. It's been so great to connect with you again. Thank you so much for joining us on the Freedom Matters podcast. Thanks for inviting me. It's been really super chatting with you. Thank you for joining us on Freedom Matters. If you like what you hear, then subscribe on your favourite platform. And until next time, we wish you happy, healthy and productive days.